Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chaitali Bag from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe, based out of Cyprus. Today, on the Army Day, we have with us retired Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni, former Chief of Staff, 14 Corps, who retired as DG Infantry. And the most exciting information I want to share with my viewers is that he was the first officer to have landed with his troops on the Siachen Glacier. With the Army Chief in his annual press conference discussing demilitarization of the glacier, we have the right person to brainstorm this most sensitive subject. Sir, welcome to ADU's chat room. And now I hand over editor ADU Sangeeta Saxena to steer the conversation ahead. Thank you, Shatali. And good evening, sir. A very happy Army Day to you, sir. And of course, to all of us. And it's just, just wonderful that it's a day on which you know, we are talk, going to talk about the, the army's battles, which are, which are at the highest battlefields in the world. And uh, sir, before we begin, you know, we, Chaitali has already told our audience that you were the first one to drop down with your uh, men. And uh, we'll just start with that little bit of introduction about what is Siachen Glaciers? Uh, first, Jehan. And uh, the question that you asked as to uh, what is and where is uh, Siachen Glacier? You know, Siachen Glacier is a 76 kilometer long glacier. And uh, it had been there as a matter of fact, if you look back, uh, Karachi Agreement 1949, you realize it that the uh, ceasefire line that was drawn was marked up to NGA 9842. And there is, it said, dense northwards. And subsequently, even after the 71 war, when the similar agreement was signed, it again said uh, NGA 9842. And the Pakistanis, over a period of time, again, I wouldn't say with the Canadians of the United States, but yes, there's a Hudson's line in the United States, which joined NGA 9842 straight with Karakaram Path. That was primarily with an air defense zone. That is for flying purposes. But the Pakistanis took full advantage of it and started what is called the cartographic aggression. And before that, they did allow a lot of Expeditions being sponsored, whether the British expeditions or the Japanese expeditions, all of them being sponsored by Pakistan, and all of them came onto Siachen Glacier from their side, of, that is from the Skadu side, onto the Siachen Glacier, and then climbed the various peaks in Venda. So, with the view to be able to convey to the world, and obviously anybody who gave permission to the mountaineers thought that yes, this area was owned and probably belonged to Pakistan. So, cartographic aggression being made, legitimizing it slowly and steadily. However, the fact that in 1963, the Pakistanis ceded or gifted Shakskam Valley to China, and that Shakskam Valley almost comes close to the Karakaram Pass. So therefore, when you join NGA 9842 with Karakaram Pass, you find that there is now a clear link China extending all along the Shakskam Valley and the Shakskam Valley being adjacent to Siachen Glacier and therefore the entire thing that means Pakistan and China linked up very closely and for a long time Chinese have been wanting to attempt through the Shakskam Pass, the Kunjara Pass which goes right up to Gwada. So there has been a thing which has been on for a long time. Now with the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor coming up so close to it and we have interjected into Siachen Glacier, we realized that Pakistanis had been attempting to do that over a period of time. And when Colonel Bull Kumar, famously known as Colonel Narendra Kumar Bull, he, when he was the commandant of the high altitude warfare school, and as luck would have it, he had a German friend who happened to have shown him a map where he was going and who was sponsoring him. And that led to realization that Pakistanis have been doing it over a period of time in an area which not many people had been going before, even though the surveys had been conducted. And by all means, that area belonged to India because there was no doubt on that score because it said very clearly, peace ceasefire line, that NGA 9842 then northwards. Karakaram Pass is not northwards. Karakaram Pass is way east. The, the word northwards, when you say it goes along the Saltoro ridge line towards the K2, the Karakaram 2, the world's second highest peak. So between K2 and the Karakaram Pass are these two. One is the Siachen Glacier and the other major uh, feature about over 5,000 odd square kilometers gifted by Pakistan to China, the Shakskam Valley. So that is where it is. And when you stand on top of Indra Kohl, the Kunjara Pass is approximately about 179 kilometers. As much as we see from Galwan, when you look at the uh, Highway 219, 
you will see that it is almost 180 kilometers from there also. So it's all a question of something which is ours and which it belongs to us. And there's no question of Pakistanis wanting to either take it by cartographic or by you know sponsoring expeditions from other countries to be able to convey to the world that yes, if you want to go to Siachen or you want to carry the beautiful peaks, the mountainous paradise, the entire area is that the sponsorship would be from Pakistan. So that got defeated. And knowing all this, that was happened from 1978, 1981, 82, 83, and then finally up Medu that we had, we occupied Siachen because we soon realized as what even Musharraf in his book, The Line of Fire said, they were, they were attempting to capture Siachen Glacier that he himself has said, India preempted them and occupied Siachen Glacier. According to Pakistan, it belongs to them, and which is incorrect primarily because we see far land and the similar agreement speaks very clearly of the area of NJ9842. So in that context, if you look at it, yes, the, the Siachen Glacier, much people would have said, well, nothing happens to be there. Of course, obviously you have the Nubra River, which originates from the glacier. It's a 76 kilometer long glacier. It's a beautiful water body, which allows the water body to come in. The Shok River, which is coming from the DBO side and going along, both these rivers meet at a place called Khalsa, then they both, both join Indus uh, River. So it's something that, which is very much ours and we must continue to occupy. I have no doubt on that score. Yeah. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, sir. There is no, not an iota of argument about it. But the truth is that uh, Pakistan stakes its claims on it. Now, because Pakistan stakes its claims on it, we'd like you to tell our audience that these claims are unfounded. Absolutely unfounded. No doubt about that. See, Pakistan has been claiming, even when Pakistan has been claiming Kashmir also, even in the new security policy that Pakistan has issued, it uses the word Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Kashmir remains the forefront and the central part of their policy. It is basically Pakistan and Kashmir, they seem to think that they are the ones who need to be talking about Kashmir. You see, look back again, the Simla Agreement. The Simla Agreement had 93,000 Pakistani prisoners of war released by the Simla Agreement. What did the Simla Agreement say? that everything would be settled bilaterally between India and Pakistan. Did it happen? Not at all. Even in the new security policy, what is Pakistan doing? Always and every time referring to the UN security resolution. What does the UN security resolution talk about of 1940, the number 47, which was there in 1948? Primarily speaks that what the government of Pakistan should do, thereafter what the government of India should do, and thereafter then what the plebiscite should take place. Has Pakistan adhered to any of those instructions, any of the directions from 1947 till day? So to expect Pakistan to be saying what it says, it says what whatever Pakistan is to say is okay. Even Jinnah has all along been saying whatever he had to say. But even Mountbatten, I must tell you, Mountbatten asked Jinnah that, can you take these tribals back? He, he said, definitely, why not? Instantly, Mountbatten realized, how come you are so confident that he could take the tribals back? If he had, he's saying at one point of time that he was not at all involved in sending the tribal, how quick was he to accept that they would be able to go back? So therefore, the complexity uh, and the complicity of Pakistan in this entire episode, and especially when it comes to the rulers of Pakistan are not the elected people, the real persons who are actually governing Pakistan in the military. And therefore, to be able to uh, I would say we must not get carried away by what Pakistan says because the past experience has been very, very sad. Pakistan does not walk the talk. That's the first thing. You cannot trust Pakistan. And thirdly, and now when Pakistan has become a vassal state of China, you expect it to do it. What it is doing, it will lead to complacency or lull India into complacency that seems seems to, to have gone well. Just look back a little bit and you find that the ceasefire agreement which was signed in February resulted in what? Pakistan easing pressure to be able to get into Afghanistan. So the whole aim was that the, how come and how much they can do what they want to do in Afghanistan. Having succeeded with Taliban in Afghanistan, what are they now doing? They're saying, okay, let's have trade agreement, let's have peace uh, and let's have it for 100 years, peace with India and all. But the core that is, Kashmir still remains central to the entire policy. What they have declassified is 62 odd pages. What they have not declassified, we don't know. 
the entire what has not been declassified will be on hate India. The entire identity of Pakistan is based on hate India. The world knows them as a, a terrorist state, a hub of terrorism. You cannot, for well, no question. And whoever might want to say, well, we had an agreement with China since 93, isn't it? Even from 1950s also, we have been talking about Panchil. 93, we had an agreement official on peace and tranquility. 96, we had. 2001, we had. 2005, have they adhered to it? All the agreements have been thrown out of the window. And therefore, to think that we can have an agreement with Pakistan to be able to do uh, the demilitarization that we have been talking about, to my view, I think it's uh, perfect. We cannot trust Pakistan. And it, Pakistan is absolutely trying to fool the whole world for reasons that Financial Action Task Force has made Pakistan look a terror state. And they've been blamed for terror funding money laundering and therefore Pakistan is now trying to show an image it is exactly that what Pakistan is attempting to do or show to the world that well from our side we are you know all in the forefront forget about the past let's start fresh nothing you cannot forget the past because Pakistan has all along ever since its creation in 1947 till date has not walked the talk it has not at all shown any any good intent or anything that needs to be done, even despite the 71, despite having given given back all the 93,000 PWs, expecting things to, what happened? Ziaulak radicalized Pakistan. Ziaulak ensured that Pakistan becomes the hub of terrorism. For what? To bleed India with 1,000 cuts and hear they're talking about a peace with India for 100 years. I think they must first at least be able to show uh, the good nature, what they can to the best of our ability. Let us see what happens. But I do not believe, I will not trust Pakistan for whatever it may be, because they have not proven themselves. And this will be lying, you know, trying to fool India or trying to fool the whole world. Because as I say, uh, Pakistan is one nation which can fool all the people at all the times. That is what they've been doing so long. Uh, sir, you were also DG in Fentry. And uh, what is generally, how does uh, the DG in Fentry plan to, you know, uh, send the troops to Siachen and then the follow up? And then uh, what is the planning? Because most of the time it's cold and uh, below freezing temperatures. So, how do you plan the regiments? How, what is generally the way it is done? <coughs> See, the DG in Fentry doesn't involve in that. That's a separate uh, department which deals with the, uh, how the troops have to be sent and who have to be sent and how it is. The DG infantry doesn't get involved. The DG infantry is primarily to ensure that they're all properly equipped, yes, to a large extent, whichever way it would be done, how the policies have to be made, that would be. But to be who will go there and what it is, no. The DG infantry does not get involved into that. And sir, uh, I mean, that's good you told us this thing because we always thought, you know, that it was the DG infantry would have a very major role in the, you know, follow up of the troops and things. So it's good to know that. Also, sir, you know, uh, on 12th, we had the press conference of the army chief in which he, uh, you know, made a statement saying that uh, uh, we are not averse to demilitarization of Siachen. Uh, can you just, uh, you know, tell us something about what the chief meant? You know, I'm sure as an, uh, you know, as somebody who's seen the thing so closely, and I'm sure you'll understand what a soldier is talking about when he says that. So, and the man, he's a soldier who heads the army. So what would, what would that have meant, you know? See, I would put it this way that, uh, well, chief's intention may be very good to say that uh, demilitarize uh, the Siachen glacier. But if you now read some Sham Saran uh, statement who was the Foreign Secretary of India, where this kind of uh, exercise had been done earlier also, in 1992 also this exercise, and uh, the, be able to sign between the two countries the, and what would, would have later become the AGPL. So each one of them were almost ready. I'm told that what uh, Mr. Sham Saran writes to say that Mr. Narsimha Rao did not follow it up and then, well, it's all history. But if you ask me, frankly speaking, uh, 
whatever we've said so far, that, that the trust deficit, there is no trust that exists between India and Pakistan because of its past conduct, that is first, second. And secondly, because of the new geostrategic uh, situation that are, are coming up and the kind of tensions that we have with China, the kind of link that Pakistan uh, has with China, the kind is almost like a surrogate state of China, the involvement of China in POK, the, invo the Kunjara Pass and the Karakoram Highway and the entire China-Pakistan economic corridor running from all along that uh, Gwada. So you realize that keeping all this in mind, whatever one might say that, you know, uh, like I understand the statement was that if they, are, they, they must sign on the dotted line or the AGPL, that was some, uh, I think it was said something like that. I would uh, say even if Pakistan was to sign on the dotted line, I wouldn't trust them at all. Because after all, uh, how can you say what's going to happen tomorrow, firstly? Secondly, the Siachen Glacier, Pakistan is nowhere near Siachen Glacier. They're miles away from Siachen Glacier. The first. So when we're talking about demilitarizing Siachen Glacier, what, what is it that Pakistan, because both of us be able to see, if I'm saying Siachen Glacier, what is Siachen Glacier in my perception should be in their perception? Because they seem to be thinking they are on Siachen Glacier. Pakistan is not on Siachen Glacier. So that is the first thing that you must know. So when they we are talking about the demilitarization, where is their military on the Siachen Glacier? I would first like to ask. The military is not on the Siachen Glacier. So whether the entire Siachen Glacier is under our custody, it is under our occupation, if I may put it, because it is to the east of Soltoro Ridge Line. So the Soltoro Ridge Line runs along on which there's a prominent pass, Siala, Bela Fondla, Yongla, all these passes. So there is no question of Pakistan being any way close to the Siachen Glacier. That's the second part. The third part, the occupation of all these Soltoro Ridge Line along, it, would, it takes us maybe from certain camps and all, even up to seven days to occupy these heights and wherever it may be even more, right? On Pakistan side, it would not even take one day. Not even one day. You read the book of uh, Musharraf in line of fire, how close they can come down and where they are right now and from where they can climb up. So there's no question. So even if they authenticate their troop positions, which they would only along wherever they are opposite us in certain areas, they, they, they are close to us, okay, for perfectly fine. But they are behind us, way, way far away, and from the way they can climb up with the kind of infrastructure that exists today, I do not believe. Fourthly, even if you were to do that, to reoccupy, should something go wrong between the two countries, should the two countries go to war, should something happen or misadventure, then who will do that? We've lost a thousand lives already trying to be there on top of the Glacier. That means now you're going for a war to reoccupy. It's something like Kargil again. Imagine occupying heights. In these such areas, the mountains depend, is the defenders part. You know, the, the, in mountains, it's a battle where the, whoever is occupying heights is the king over there. Now you lose all of it, you come back. Pakis also say go back from wherever they are. They are not on Siachen. So Siachen is entirely with us. But wherever they are, they may be in Ali Brahmza, they may be down below in Skardu, or they may be a little opposite Gyongla, some places. They may, may be eyeball to eyeball and stuff. What next? What next? If they come and occupy, what would, you, what would we be doing thereafter? How? We are, we are not going to go to an international forum to sell. That's all too late. Because 9 tenth occupation is possession. Because if you have lost the possession by whatever means with a country which you cannot trust and not at all, uh, nothing ever has happened. It is nothing because we are in, uh, just because we went to Siachen and therefore I'm talking as now a veteran to have seen that area. So it seems almost it will become very difficult should the Pakistanis now today say that India preempted. That means from all along, their eyes were on Siachen Glacier. They wanted to come and occupy. That they failed to occupy in 1984 is a separate story. The fact that the intention, the intent, even in the new security policy, it's very, very clear. What do they say? Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. That means in their mind, the Jammu and Kashmir is illegally occupied by India. And all of it is the same contradiction in the same security policy. They're talking about wanting to be the front lines, this thing speaking for the Kashmiris, they've forgotten about Jammu. Same document talks about Article 370 abrogation, August 5, and thereafter they would want 
पाकिस्तान इंसिडेंट विच से पाकिस्तान कहता है रात है कश्मीरी नेता भी बोलते हैं रात है तालिबान भी बोलते हैं रात है आईएसआई भी बोला रात है ये तो सुबह की बात है सो दिस इज व्हाट पाकिस्तान इज ऑल अबाउट यू कैन नॉट ट्रस्ट देम यू जस्ट कैन नॉट ट्रस्ट देम इट्स अ मिली भगत एंड इन दैट मिली भगत देयर एक सारे के सारे एक माला के मोती हैं तो अंडर दिस सरकमस्टेंसेस व्हाटएवर वी हैव वी सी इट लेटर दे हैव स्पोकन अबाउट 100 इयर्स ऑफ पीस विद इंडिया लेट देम एटली शो इट फॉर वन ईयर लेट देम एटली शो इट फॉर 10 इयर्स we have enough time to uh, live peacefully but to say so ki trade ke dwara you know the aim may basic aim is economically pakistan is shattered it's absolutely bankrupt nobody is wanting to give loan to pakistan and if it is china which is wanting to give loan or money to pakistan pakistan would not just become a vassal state it would become a part of it because it will lose as it as it is hundreds of the pakistani girls are have to marry the chinese boys because there are much less women in pakistan today than there in uh, china today so i not under the present circumstances where we have tension with china or with pakistan pakistan doesn't seem to believe they will continue to uh, use terrorism as an instrument of state policy they will tomorrow i can say it with i, I don't know but with the way pakistanis are going about the way they establishing the foothold in afghanistan the way the taliban propped up and propped up by pakistan is there the way the haqqani network is functioning over there pakistan will say well all the terrorists that are coming to india are not from pakistan these are from afghanistan how do we know that's an independent country please deal with afghanistan oh you been doing all this nurturing them bringing them up propping them up and doing everything whatever you are doing and now you are saying quickly uh, we are not doing anything and from the shakshgam valley people start entering the chinese or whoever they may be it it will be very very difficult i think uh, it's a good intent definitely a good intent who does not want peace with our neighbors we definitely would want peace with neighbor who does not want trade with neighbor but ima- imagine a trade of over 100 billion dollars with china and then we have tension with china then we are, almost china is like an enemy to india the way it is conducting since uh, i think april of 2020 till date they, they don't deny the fact the way the chinese are behaving in the way they are pressurizing on all fronts can we expect the more than 100 billion dollar trade must be almost self financing the chinese activities for free in south asia the kind of profits they must be earning from this trade alone which is touched over 100 billion dollar financing all misadventurism in south asia pressurizing india by even financing the neighbors of india to do what they are doing and here pakistan is trying to convey to us will have trade with you and let's put the kashmir in the back burner with a rider that should the trade not develop then again it goes back to square one under these circumstances can we th- even think even think of demilitarizing the siachen glacier according to me definitely no intent is good intent is excellent i would go along to say yes we want peace but the kind of country that pakistan is since 1947 till date it has been controlled by military military in pakistan has a 20 billion dollar business annually pakistan in this only 8 to 10 billion dollars in its military a 20 billion dollar is from onions to cement to schools to colleges to name anything and everything in pakistan is run by the military including malls that's the way pakistan army function so a trade is in their hand and who is imran khan he will not be there tomorrow and who, who will say what is, what is going to be happening i won't trust pakistan definitely not at this stage that's my take the intent is good well uh, you know whatever it may be but you cannot trust pakistan pakistan must not be taken for its face value pakistan must first walk the talk show its good intent maybe for 2 3 years let's see what pakistan does how much of every now and then in jammu and kashmir the way the terrorism is being you know the infiltration is not coming from anywhere else other than from pakistan who are, where, where are these infiltrators coming you heard the dgp police jammu say that of kashmir say very clearly that of the 179 militants 18 of them came from pakistan so these are the kind of people and this is the kind of uh, and look at the way imran khan has never left an opportunity to condemn and criticize india 
So in that context, Pakistan cannot be trusted. Yeah. Uh, to, yes, sir, you're absolutely right. Everything is in the hands of the military there. And then the military is the one which is also managing the Siachen, uh, you know, part of our, our Siachen. But it is at their end, you said they are very far away, they are nowhere near, but then the military feels that it needs to be there. So in that case, uh, you know, we, I would like to understand from you that uh, whoever be the prime minister doesn't make a difference to uh, Pakistan at all. But then, you know, Siachen will always remain uh, a bone of contention for them. And if they continue this way, how do you think, you know, we, we can, you know, de you, uh, I'm, you're right when you say that demilitarization uh, cannot happen because we cannot trust them. But then, you know, which will mean that this will be an endless war absolutely for India. It will never end. Uh, what happens uh, in this kind of a scenario where we don't trust, you know, Pakistan can't be trusted, it's not a trustworthy neighbor for all its uh, acts since 1947 till date, even the tribesmen that we talk about in 1947, the way they were sent and why way uh, the planning was right under Jinnah, the whole thing was uh, executed. So you realize that Pakistan is not to be trusted. And the very fact that Pakistan is controlled by the military, right? You can say uh, from Ayub Khan days, to Ziaulak and then to Musharraf and now Bajwa, a remote control. So even Imran Khan is almost like a puppet prime minister of the military. And therefore the military really rules the roost in Pakistan. Under these circumstances, to be able to uh, have a policy where the Pakistanis have even the international border that we call, uh, they don't call that an international border. So what we refer, so there is perceptual difference the entire identity of Pakistan, I look at it, is hate India. With that and the cons and the very fact that the military all along wants to show that they count most, it is by hating India and creating their own little empire. Where a Pakistan army runs a business which is above over twenty billion dollars in uh, Pakistan, and from onions to cement to anything and everything, including walls, all run by Pakistan, where they generate over twenty billion dollars. They don't even spend about eight to ten billion dollars on their army. The way they go about getting aid and the begging bowl the world over, the way China is financing them, the way they get aid also besides what they spend. So in, under these circumstances, I don't think, not definitely no way can we trust Pakistan for whatever work they may be. Any agreement can be thrown out of the window within no time, as we have seen it with China, we have seen it with Pakistan. Pakistan has not even for a moment adhered to the similar agreement, which was the greatest defeat of Pakistan. If after taking back 93,000 PWs, if they were to go back to square one, and start thinking of, uh, you know, uh, bleeding India with thousand cuts. How are we going to trust Pakistan? Pakistan is not to be trusted. And therefore, definitely no, I would say, no way they, we should disengage. And what you said, uh, well, the Pakistanis can go back wherever they want to go back. Uh, this thing, the entire land belongs to us. And whatever we want to do, we'll see what we want to do subsequently. But as of now, I think the aspect of demilitarization, much that it is a good intent, but I don't think it can be executed in the present circumstances. So that was wonderful. And I think nobody could have explained it better. You know, it's coming from the horse's mouth from a person who's seen Siachin at such close quarters. And uh, our audience will be very, very fortunate to listen to all this. And so are, are we, you know, because for us also, you know, to understand these things, from a person who's seen it, we haven't. And uh, also that there's a myth that women do not go to Siachen. When they go, there's firing. So, you know, we, we went right till the base camp, but we were not allowed, allowed to go, go ahead, you know. So I think that is something which I really missed. And I was telling Chetali that when, you know, when we become very old, probably there would be some day when this myth will get busted and then we'll be allowed to go and see Siachen for ourselves. Thank you very much, sir, for this interview. It was wonderful. And uh, I can really be thankful for one thing that on Army Day, we talk of a subject which is absolutely, you know, a, a part of the Army. Siachen Glacier is a, a, top, a topic in the current affairs and news and general knowledge only because of the Army, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, nice. ahead and a happy Army Day to everybody. Thank you, sir. Same to you, Jain, sir. Thanks, Chitali.
Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Of course, Siachen is always a burning topic, not only for the army, also for the civilians. So I'm sure uh, hearing every, all that that you discussed today will be really interesting for all our audience. Thanks for your time. And uh, we wish you a very happy army day. Thank you so much. And we hope to have you again in our chat room sometime later. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, ma'am. Jens. Jai.